Good to have you here with us. Dr. Dodi couldn't make it, so it gives me the honor of privilege of greeting everybody. Hello. My name is Yotam Heineberg. Uh, I do, I generate interventions that increase resilience and compassion here at Seacare. And we're all gathering here today to greet and learn from Professor Owen Flanagan. And I have some words of introduction for Professor Flanagan. And this either goes all the way through, or we stop once you blush, so you can let me know. Um, so Professor Flanagan is the James B. Duke University professor. Uh, he's the co-director for the Center of Comparative Philosophy. He has had visiting positions at Berkeley, Brandeis, Princeton, Harvard, and La Trobe in Australia, University of Vienna, City University of Hong Kong, as well as several fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities. In 1993-94, Professor Flanagan was president of the Society for Philosophy and Psychology. In 1998, he was recipient of the Romanel National Phi Beta Kappa Award given annually to one American philosopher for distinguished contributions to philosophy and the public understanding of philosophy. He has lectured on every continent except Antarctica, where he has been. <laughs> Besides enjoying writing articles, reviews, and contributing to curricula, Flanagan has written and edited many books, including The Bodhisattva's Brain, Buddhism Naturalized. He is currently finishing a book, The Geography of Morals, Varieties of Moral Possibility, which Oxford will publish. As an invited speaker for Seeker's Meng Wu Lecture Series, which is named in honor of Seeker's two founding patrons, Ched Meng Tan and Wayne Wu, Dr. Flanagan will present the lecture titled The Geography of Morals, Buddhist and Stoic Arguments for Eliminating Anger. It is our great honor and pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much. So it's a great honor to be here um, at Stanford, a place that I love, and uh, an honor to be here uh, at Seacare, a project. I think I was here at the very beginning, um, uh, first, the inaugural conference of Seacare, it uh, seems like five or six years ago uh, by now. And uh, actually, I gave a, a talk, the title of which I'm a little bit embarrassed by at Seacare. It was called Compassion is Overrated. Um, but um, it really was n not to overrate, that compassion was overrated so much. It was that um, uh, justice was sometimes underestimated uh, in certain traditions. But today I'm going to focus on, um, there's a handout, and I decided, uh, at least I love talks that don't involve PowerPoint, and uh, maybe you do uh, too. So let me give you, oh, okay. <laughs> So, uh, but there's a handout, and we'll see how well I do on handouts. I also was so thrilled because at the, uh, at the Stanford of the Southeast, my university, we do not have blackboards that actually like are, have slate. And we never ever have chalk. So I took the opportunity to actually write um, a few things that I noticed this morning um, uh, might be useful to you. Because my talk is, uh, is a, a set of reflections. It's not kind of a talk with a uh, argument, although I have a, a view that I'm developing on anger. I think that anger uh, is a destructive emotion. Um, it might be a necessary emotion. I'm still not sure about that. But I thought that uh, what I would do today is um, uh, introduce you a little bit to a project that I'm doing now, which is called, uh, as you just heard, the Geography of Morals, that's the title of the, uh, the book that I'm doing. And it's a, it's a book on cross-cultural philosophy. And uh, what I'll talk to you about today is a specific moment uh, uh, in the book, uh, give you the sort of broad sweeping view, where I talk about cultures um, or traditions which have different attitudes towards anger than I'll say we do. Uh, now, what exactly our views are about anger, I'm not entirely positive, but I'll try to at least um, uh, introduce us to um, some uh, great philosophical views. One is Stoicism from about the first or second century of the Common Era, and the other one comes from Shantideva, eighth century Buddhist. Um, and I'll talk primarily about two um, texts that have as their bottom line the view that we should not just moderate or modify or be careful about anger, we should actually, as Seneca says, extirpate it. Get rid of it. It's a horrible emotion, and you should get rid of it. 
Now that's a hard nut to that, that's a hard amount to swallow, and uh, even I, who have been working on this for a long time, am not entirely convinced. But what I'll do today, and this is what uh, we'll go through the handout, is I'll talk a little bit about both these views. Probably spend a little more time on the Buddhist view, uh, and then talk about some objections to um, uh, uh, giving up on anger, um, why it might be important and necessary. Um, so let me um, start this way, and I'll come to the board in a little while. My friend Mark said that uh, I'll have to read it to you because uh, I didn't tell you to bring glasses, and I will do that. <laughs> um, in any case, uh, so I was inspired, a good friend of mine, a uh, teacher of mine, actually never a formal teacher, but a philosopher who I've been influenced a great deal by, um, I went to his 80th birthday party, this is Alistair McIntyre, in Dublin uh, a few years ago. He must be about 86 now, and he's still uh, alive and well, uh, living in South Bend, Indiana. And uh, McIntyre uh, uh, has a paper, which is the first quote on, on your uh, handout, called um, On Having Survived the Academic Moral Philosophy of the 20th Century. And I want to read this uh, passage. Um, although it doesn't have to do with anger. He says, for on the view that I have found myself compelled to take, contemporary academic moral philosophy, hi Brian, <laughs> contemporary academic moral philosophy turns out to be seriously defective as a form of rational inquiry. How so? First, the study of moral philosophy has become divorced from the study of morality, or rather of moralities, and by so doing has distanced itself from practice. We do not expect serious work in the philosophy of physics from students who have never studied physics or on the philosophy of law from students who have never studied law, but there is not even a hint of a suggestion that courses in social and cultural anthropology and in certain areas of sociology and psychology might be a prerequisite for graduate work in moral philosophy. Yet without such courses, no adequate sense of the varieties of moral possibility can be acquired. One remains imprisoned by one's own upbringing. So this is the project, and I don't want to get into sort of how that fits or is a good description of contemporary analytic moral philosophy, but it is. Um, uh, and, um, but I, I especially want to focus on the, just the last parts, which is, is simply this, that even philosophical reflection, which at least philosophers like to think is of a deep and quite general sort, um, it's still culturally completely embedded. So if one starts to examine, for example, the warrant for uh, anger or thinking about justified anger uh, or uh, righteous indignation, um, it's very easy to fall into the trap of repeating things that w people inside or internal to your culture already say about things. So you're really just speaking to yourself and reinstating the very norms that you already have. So this is one of the er reasons I love comparative philosophy or cross-cultural philosophy. It allows us to explore possibility space that isn't just the space of our own upbringing. So what I'll try to do today is introduce you to um, some, uh, some thinking that's outside um, uh, the normal. Uh, so that's the first point on your project, this inspiration from McIntyre. The second, uh, some of you may know this, but I just want to um, um, uh, say it. I, I've had, uh, over the course of my career, a lot of dealings with um, psychologists, neuroscientists, social scientists in general. And um, uh, those of you who hang around such people know that they've been saying for 30 years, we really hope that college students are representative. Sophomores in college or freshmen at places like Stanford and Harvard and Duke and Emory are representative because almost all the information we have in psychological science is based on them. <laughs> and that's true, and that's important to know. Well, the answer has finally come through, um, uh, and in a paper, I mean, this is just one of many papers, but a paper that I have number two on my handout which I call Weird Sources. This is a paper by a group of people at um, uh, University of British Columbia. It came out in the Beha Brain and Behavioral Sciences in 2010. And they asked the following question. They were worried about this, exactly this question. How representative are the subjects from whom, who have yielded our information about what humans are like deep down inside beneath the clothes of culture, namely sophomores? And they basically, uh, in uh, North American universities, and they noticed this. I think this is roughly the right statistics. Um, over 90% of all the findings in psychology are based on North American college students. 
a full 80 or 85 percent on American college students. And their question then was, well, given the anthropological record, given the sort of history of human culture, how representative a population is that? And their answer was this. Weird, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic populations are the least representative um, culture in the history of humankind. You'd be better off getting cavemen. Okay, the most unrepresentative. After all, just think about it for a second. Literacy is only 50,000 years old. I mean, 5,000 years old. Modern humans have been around for 250,000. We're only literate for 5,000 years. That's just, but all the subjects being studied are literate college students in rich countries, Western countries with democratic societies. So this is kind of um, helpful to those of us who want to say, Let's rethink or pay attention to the possibility spaces that have been explored by great and wise people over human history from non-Western traditions because it, they make available to us possibilities for being different than we are, possibilities that maybe we haven't explored or haven't explored in a long time. So too it is with anger, I want to say today, that we haven't, uh, we haven't explored, I think in a systematic way, how we might be different uh, than we now are. So let me open with two stories. Actually, I'll just open with one story because it would take me too long if I told two stories. Um, so the first story, actually Brian back there was there at this time, um, and I'll also tell this story. So in March 2000, I visited Dharamsala, India for four days of meetings with the 14th Dalai Lama, Tenzin Gyatso, some of his fellow Buddhists and a group of Western scientists, mostly psychologists and neuroscientists, to discuss the topic of destructive emotions and how to overcome them. Daniel Goldman's 2003 book on these meetings was, uh, with that title is a good report. There was much to learn at these discussions in the Dalai Lama's residence and many surprises. Here's one unforgettable one. It became clear after a day or so of talks that Tibetan Buddhists believe that anger, resentment, and their suite are categorically bad, always unwarranted, wrong, unwholesome, as they are inclined to say. That wasn't surprising by, my, by itself. We have many norms for appropriate anger, such as don't get too angry, don't get so angry, as we sometimes say, and wrath is a deadly sin. But we do not think that one, indeed no one, should ever get angry, that anger is always wrong. For us, the right kind of anger reveals that you see and care about something of value. Every day, not so warranted anger shows that one is normal. Minimally, we expect and tolerate a certain amount of it. But then there was this kicker, even more mind-boggling. These are Buddhists who believe that anger could be eliminated in mortals, that there are practices that actually work, excuse me, there are practices that actually work so that it is possible to not experience anger, practices that can extirpate anger, cleanse the soul of tendencies to anger. I got that these practices, that there are practices and rules of decorum counting to 10, sublimation, or stuffing it. Norms of apt anger that keep us from expressing anger and that work to contain it. But not experience anger at all seemed unnatural, weird, not human. Again, self-work to keep from getting pissy over small frustrations makes good sense and is possible. But except for a rare saintly bird of maximally even temperament, not experiencing anger at the cosmos or the gods for the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, and especially at evil people for their awfulness seem close to a psychological impossibility. Then there is the fact that most people I know are raised to think it okay, permissible, possibly sometimes required to feel and express outrage. Righteous anger is something we ought sometimes to experience and express, something that certain people or states of affairs deserve. So I found myself posing this thought experiment to the Dalai Lama. Imagine one were to find oneself in a public space, a park, a movie theater, where one realizes that one is seated next to Hitler, or Stalin, or Pol Pot, or Mao. I added that to get a rise out of him. <laughs> Early in the execution of the genocides they were actually per uh, perpet perpetrating. We, I said, my people, think it would be appropriate first to feel moral anger, possibly outrage at Hitler et al., and second, that it would be okay, possibly required, to kill him, supposing one had the means. What about you Tibetan Buddhists? The Dalai Lama turned to consult the high lamas who were normally seated behind him. 
like a lion's pride? After a few minutes of whispered conversation in Tibetan with his team, the Dalai Lama turned back to our group and explained that one should kill Hitler. Actually, with some ceremonial fanfare, in a way to mix cultural practices, a samurai warrior might. He said something like, you should kill him with a word in Tibetan, he said, with furious rage. He says it's stopping a very bad karmic causal chain. So yes, kill him, but don't be angry. What could this mean? How did it make sense to think of one human being killing another, being motivated to kill another human being without feeling, without activating the suite of reactive attitudes such as anger, resentment, and blame? Stoics, excellent warriors, thought something similar. That when effective action is required against an enemy, including his elimination, emotions like fear and anger get in the way. Immobilize, under or overreach, and undermine skillfully achieving one's aims. In a direct challenge to Aristotle, Seneca writes, it is easier to banish dangerous emotions than to rule them. The mature person is disciplined and thoughtful, whereas the angry person is undisciplined and sloppy. Anger is excited by empty matters hovering on the outskirts of the case. Now that's the zone that I'm going to talk about today. Okay? These views that come from two entirely different traditions, one of which the Stoic tradition has influenced certain strands of thought in Western culture. Founding fathers were influenced by the Stoics. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was influenced by the Stoics. Um, uh, the Buddhist thing uh, is a different sort. Now what I did write on the board here, so I'll say this, um, I realized I'm going to be not being very, very precise in uh, when I talk about anger. So let me just tell you at the beginning that I have thought how to deal with it precisely. <laughs> uh, and I put up nine distinctions here that you could sort of worry about. And I'll just say something about each of them. So as I'm speaking, you'll sometimes think things like this. Like here's an example. Um, so uh, number one, anger or angry feelings. By that I mean, I mean that to refer to the phenomenal state, that is the experiential state, that is experienced as anger. Uh, the phenomenal state that feels or is angry. It includes whatever psychological states the angry person experiences, reddening, heat, and the impulse to strike out. Now, angry behavior um, is any behavior in the world that results from anger. For example, strong words, criticism, gossip, shaming, or striking. I mean, you might think something like this. You know, you're in a line at um, uh, Starbucks, uh, uh, you see a person starting to move around, and you tell that they're getting a little pissy uh, about things. They're annoyed that the person in front of them ordered a triple macchiato with virgin coconut shavings on it, and it's taking the barista a long time, and they're starting to get riled up. That's what I mean by anger. It's like the feeling, whatever that feeling is, that's familiar to all of us. Uh, it may have relations to annoyance and frustration, but it's in that ballpark, and it's identifiable by certain phenomenological features. If the person then says something, okay, to display their anger, that's angry behavior, okay? And I, I stipulate that angry behavior um, is behavior that's, for purposes of what I'm talking about today, is behavior that uh, uh, is produced because of feelings of anger. Now Seneca, by the way, in, um, in this wonderful essay Seneca has called De Ira on anger, brilliant essay, beautifully written, He's talking to his brother Novartis, and Seneca is giving the argument for what I'll say in a few minutes, that anger is a very, very bad emotion, it always gets out of hand, and so on and so forth. And his brother Novartis says, but wait a second, what if someone kills our uh, parents, rapes our mother, and kills our father, and takes our children? And Seneca says, oh, you should kill them. You have an obligation to do that. Now that would not even be angry behavior on the view that I'm saying. It would look a lot like angry behavior. That is, usually we would, or I would certainly, take revenge for my family out of anger. But there looks in these, some of these practices that are being recommended by the Stoics. And remember, they were great warriors. They were like the best warriors, <laughs> okay? So it wasn't that they were against violence, which is an interesting thing. So these things can come apart, but they were against the allowing yourself to be caught up in certain phenomenal states. But anyway, that's just a quick distinction. Then what I mean by anger norms, and this is important for my purposes today, 
By anger norms, I mean permissions or recommendations about appropriate anger. How angry one is allowed to get, how angry one is supposed to or permissibly to feel in different circumstances, and behavioral ones, including what it's permissible to say in response to being angry. So within our culture, as I'll say shortly, the best way to think about our culture, I think, is to say that we are what Seneca would call, we're Aristotelians about anger. And what I mean by that first pass is simply this. Aristotle, you don't have to remember any of your previous education about Aristotle. I'm not assuming I'm talking to people who are professionally trained in philosophy. But Aristotle has the idea that every virtue is a, has a mean between an excess and a deficiency. So the soldier who is brave is not foolhardy, that's the excess, nor does the soldier cower behind the rocks, that's cowardly. He's, he's, he kind of nails it. He has the right amount of fearlessness in the right time, in the right situation, and so on. And so Aristotelians tend to think that, that for each and every virtue, there's a mean. For vices, there's not a mean. There's no like, right way to commit adultery at the right time and the right person. So. But, but for all the virtues, courage, wisdom, kindness, and so on and so forth, you have to have, find the mean between an excessive amount of it and a, so that's what I call on the handout a containment view. The containment view says roughly this, um, you know, uh, within our culture, uh, there's a, you, you haven't told me the truth, I'm permitted to be angry at you for not telling me the truth, but perhaps the norms say I'm not permitted to curse you out in certain ways, okay? I'm, I'm entitled to tell you what I think of you, uh, what well, I think what you did is wrong, but the norms don't go to sort of crazy displays of my fury. It will depend on, so we're allowed to say in response to people being angry towards us, I can say, you're being too angry, which is an acknowledgement that you have a right to some anger, but not quite as much as you're giving me right now. And of course, there's possibilities that this is all self-serving. I'm just not liking what I'm hearing and please stop. Okay. Um, anger scripts are socio and culturally normative um, scripts for anger and angry behavior. So in Three Stooges comedies, they're scripts. The brothers Mo, Larry, and Curly display this syndrome. You harm me, I get angry at you, and I hit you in the head with a frying pan. Okay, these vary from culture to culture, what you're allowed to do. And who's allowed to do it? There's hierarchies in terms of who's allowed to express anger to certain people. Now justified anger is going to be the sort of big um, problem, you might say, for views that think you should extirpate anger. What I have up there is justified anger number five, and righteous anger, and maybe righteous indignation. And so what I mean for purposes of today by righteous anger um, is um, anger that's warranted or considered warranted by high values, especially, especially justice violations. So for example, getting angry in the line at Starbucks, um, that would be weird. I mean, it's, we allow it all over the place. In fact, I think that in general, one of the reasons that this discussion is interesting, at least to me, is I think we allow ourselves sloppy permissions all over the place to be very angry people. And uh, that's something not good about our form of life. Now, whether or not that means we should get rid of it, extirpate it, sublimate, metabolize it, I mean, I don't know about that. But, but what I have in mind by what people would call justified anger is, okay, this warrants anger because there's, a, justi there's a, a, a justice violation, a fairness violation, say racism or sexism. Righteous indignation is sometimes used as a synonym for it, um, and I wouldn't have much more to say about that. And then there's punishment, violence, and war. And some people think, this is again just to separate these out analytically, um, it seems to be an idea that the Dalai Lama has in the anecdote that I gave. Seneca certainly has it because of his views about war. Um, Seneca says sometimes, what has anger given us? He says, anger has given us the desolation of culture, of cities. All the cities in the West have been crushed because of angry people fighting angry wars. What's interesting about his view is he's not against war, though. He thinks sometimes you have to fight wars. Um, uh, and, uh, but the angry ones always overreach and cause much, destruction, much more destruction and mayhem. But you technically could believe, for example, people who believe in legally punishing people um, uh, because they're dangerous um, might feel um, that they deserve punishment, but uh, don't feel any anger towards them. Actually, this is, the, this is a general Buddhist view, by the way, um, uh, about um, 
differences in views about individual responsibility. So for one reason, by the way, in addition to what I said about why you are allowed to kill Hitler, namely you're stopping a bad causal karmic chain, another reason, another way of thinking about someone like Hitler is he's not individually responsible. He's a bad node in the way the universe is unfolding. He's an unfortunate victim of his own genes, upbringing, the culture at the time, and so on. And it's overreach, it's sort of psychic overreach to blame him individually for what he's causing. So this is a very, I admit, a different kind of attitude about the metaphysics of responsibility and individuality, but it's out there. And of course, there are people even inside our legal traditions who think that we ought to have the same attitude towards people who do horrific things. Namely, we might have to sort of constrain them, but we ought not to think that they themselves chose this road um, rather than some other road. Now, this is obviously a very, very um, complicated uh, set of metaphysical issues. But anyway, that's sort of the terrain. Okay, so now let's go to, uh, let me talk about, so now I just want to, uh, walk us through uh, these views, and we'll have plenty of time for discussion. Uh, hopefully this will challenge. Okay, um, the, um, so uh, Seneca in uh, this uh, first century view, as I said already, now I'm on page two, um, is trying to respond to uh, what is probably the view that I think we, weird people, Western educated, industrialized, and of course I look around the room and I realize you're not all, okay, Western, but you get the idea. Um, uh, I think uh, he thinks that we are, and I think this is right, we are heirs and heiresses to something like this moderate uh, view of Aristotle. We think anger is okay up to a point, but that it sometimes exceeds itself. So, uh, so in a direct challenge um, to uh, Aristotle, Seneca writes this. He says, Aristotle stands forth in defense of anger. You might think, by the way, that what Seneca is doing here is a little bit like a uh, uh, person internal inside a Christian tradition saying, and the Old Testament says this. I mean, he's taking, th these are, he realizes that he stands in a lineage of great thinkers, Plato and Aristotle, and Aristotle's on first at the time he's writing this, okay? This is the great ascendancy of the Roman Empire. He says, Aristotle stands forth in defense of anger and forbids it to be uprooted, saying it is a spur to virtue. But, Seneca says, it is easier to banish dangerous emotions than to rule them. The mature person is disciplined and thoughtful, whereas the angry person is undisciplined and sloppy. He says, anger is excited by empty matters hovering on the outskirts of the case. That just seems to me to be a really rich <laughs> and sort of telling um, observation about what happens when we get all angry. And I'm, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of channeling, hopefully, that we're all like remembering times, maybe it happened earlier today, that we, we get fussy, he says, about the um, things on the outskirts of the case. We cause damage beyond where the fault lies when we get angry. It's a very, very common piece of the psychology and the phenomenology of it. Virtue, uh, 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 argues our adversary, quote, ought to be angry with what is base. Now that's the view of justified anger, okay? That the, the Aristotelian or the moderation person or the containment view is that Okay, you might not be justified in getting upset at the traffic or at the woman ordering the tri triple macchiato in the uh, Starbucks, uh, but there are some things about which, um, which the base things, uh, when people are treated um, unjustly, for example. But Seneca replies, he says, to rejoice and be glad is the proper and natural function of virtue. It is beneath her dignity to be angry. So there's some kind of metaphysical view of virtue which is supposed to appeal to you. You have to put yourself in the mood here. I'm not saying there's any decisive argument, but it's, it's kind of still channeling a sort of earlier Greek view that a person has his or her eyes on what's true, what's good and, the, and beautiful, and that the aim of virtue is something that has to do with uh, perfection. It doesn't have to do with harm. Now, this might be a questionable uh, assumption. Uh, he does seem to think that the aim of anger is transparent and known to everyone, and he says this, Anger is the desire to repay suffering. It's the desire to repay suffering. Now, that's, that looks to me like, a, as we say, an empirical psychological claim. We'd have to like sort of look into the anthropology and the psychology of anger to decide whether or not that it's, that's its root. 
but there is some literature on this and I looked into it. Um, it's a common enough view that uh, one of the sort of psychobiological functions of anger is what is called payback. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, giving harm uh, back for someone to, uh, who uh, has harmed you. So uh, Seneca himself uh, distinguishes between episodes of anger and angry people. Now this seems important. Any theory of anger will have to do this, right? We all get angry sometimes, but hopefully we're not perceived as or judged to be or judge ourselves to be angry people. But he has, a, uh, again, a brilliant, this is why I love to read, um, great wisdom because people were very, very, very smart and thoughtful and observant long before there were sort of empirical scientific methods or doing fMRIs. They were watching each other, <laughs> okay? And this is very, really quite important. So he notices this. He says, there are episodes of anger and there are angry people. The latter Seneca calls irascible. The episodically angry person and the constitutionally angry person are compared to the person who drinks too much once in a while. Uh, and uh, the alcoholic who is always drinking or disposed to drink. Anger comes in varieties. This is a very funny moment in Seneca. He says, anger comes in varieties and the Greeks are better than the Romans at naming them. There are episodes and persons who we describe as, these are translations, but bitter, harsh, peevish, frantic, clamorous, surly, and fierce. The Greeks have those words. The Romans sort of just have one general category, right? But he's saying this is, this is like really analytically precise. You want to sort of focus in on what the, sometimes, by the way, uh, Seneca and some of these other thinkers will, call, will, will say, this is a kind of an interesting taxonomic issue uh, in psychology, whether anger is the genus and then things like peevishness, frustration, annoyance are varieties of it or whether they may be something else. These would be complicated sort of psychophysical questions to ask and answer. But he, uh, anyway, Seneca thinks that they have something to do in common. And we're told that um, sulkiness, Seneca says, uh, is a refined form of irascibility. And irascibility, we are told, is angry with the truth itself. The thought is that anger almost always overreaches and overreacts. It is incontinent. Now, Seneca has wonderful things describing the face of the angry person. He says, Look at the face. It's terrible. Who wants to be like that? No one should want to make a face like that. Okay? So there's, there's a lot of interesting sort of um, uh, use of various kinds of psychological methods. Now, um, I'm not going to say anything more about um, uh, the Stoics, although I'm happy to in discussion, other than that they are the possibility proof, at least of the fact that there is a, there's two claims going on in what I'm talking about today. One is you might call it a descriptive claim. Uh, well, actually, there are two descriptive claims. One is a descriptive claim just about the history of ideas that says this. Some really smart people at various points in time have thought that extirpating anger is a good idea. Evidence number one. Stoics have thought that. Um, a second descriptive claim. Some really smart people have thought that it's possible to extirpate anger. Now that's interesting that anyone's ever thought that because I sure didn't think that um, or it seems really hard to me. Seneca thought that, all Stoics thought that um, and uh, Buddhists think that or at least some Buddhists think that. Okay? That these emotions actually they may seem to come with the equipment, we may be very familiar with them but that may well be uh, the fact that they're familiar because of the social ecologies that we've been brought up in and we live in as opposed to that they're absolutely intrinsic or um, uh, basic to our nature. In fact, just a funny aside about Seneca. Um, uh, you know, in Aristotle, Aristotle's famous for the idea um, in the poetics of catharsis because he wonders about the following really interesting question. Why the heck would people go to watch tragedies like Oedipus or Antigone or Hecuba why did anybody like pay money to go watch terrible things happen? It's the same thing that we might qu question ourselves about like why do we watch, you know, want to go see zombies eat other zombie faces? Okay. Well, his was a little higher brow question than that. But um, his answer was it's because it produces a catharsis. It produces a catharsis of pity and fear in us. We realize that there but for fortune we could end up like Antigone who goes mad and loses it because her brothers were on different sides of a war or Oedipus who slept with his mother and tears his eyes out, or Hecuba who finds her Medea who find themselves to be 
uh, have suffered the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune so badly that they themselves become murderers of young people. Aristotle thought this is, so he thought seeing, seeing tragedies was good for us because it purges us of pity and fear. Notice he doesn't say anger, pity and fear. We fear that therefore that could happen to us and we pity them because we're sympathetic human beings and somehow that's a release, famous cathartic kind of release. Seneca wrote on tragedy too. He said what you should learn from tragedy and should instruct the kids to learn from tragedy is don't be like those tragic heroes. They're losing it. You shouldn't want to be a person that loses it. Antigone loses it. Oedipus loses it. So this is an interesting different attitude towards, again, sort of what we might think is a necessary sort of psychological uh, feature. Okay. So now I'm going to turn. So, th so, that, so that's the first, the descriptive claims. The normative claim then is this. It's an entirely different claim, not descriptive at all. The normative claim is that, and they're right, it would really be a really good idea to get rid of anger. You ought to get rid of anger. Or you ought to go down the path of trying to get rid of anger. You would be a better person if you got rid of your anger, if you engaged in practices to get rid of your anger. When I say get rid of, I'm using this word from Seneca, extirpate. I don't really know what extirpate means, but you know, you get the idea. You're suddenly without it. Please, you had a question. I'm sorry. Can you just talk a bit more about angry with the truth itself? Um, yeah. I'll, can I come back to that later on? See, yeah, this phrase, actually, when I read it now, I thought, why do I need to talk about that now? Because it's opening up a can of worms, and you see it. Um, the, in both, I'll say this much. What does it mean to be angry with the tooth itself, that you're getting all out of, bent out of shape at you know, the, the supermarket or Starbucks or on the road or about what's happening to you or that these, uh, your dog died? Um, he, both the Stoics and the Buddhists, as you'll now see, think that one of the main reasons for getting bent out of shape so easily it's because we don't see things under the right perspective. We're too ego-centered. Ego so everything that happens to me, there's 150 people waiting in Starbucks, but it's all about me that you're ordering that drink that's bothering me. Um, or something bad happened in the world, like things are not going that well someplace in uh, uh, some part of the world, and it's harming me. It's making me upset. Okay? It's a sort of a self-focus. So the Stoics, like the Epicureans, used to think that it was a good idea to go around, and this is going to make a comeback in moral education, saying maxims to yourself. Like you're supposed to say to yourself things like, be indifferent to indifferent things. Be indifferent to indifferent things. You're thinking that this matters, as they used to say, subspecie eternitatis. From, from the point of view of eternity, it doesn't matter. So this is where if you start to see things from the right perspective. Actually, Stoics and Epicureans thought that astronomy was really good um, antidote to taking yourself too seriously. Because from the point of view of eternity, you don't matter very much. OK, that's the vicinity. It's it. OK, so let me go now to um, the second text. Um, so Shanti David, I wouldn't spend much time on this. Um, so Shantideva's 8th century um, uh, uh, Mahayana Buddhist and his famous book called The Bodhisattva's Way of Life. It's a beautiful book. It's kind of a liturgy. It's a primer on Buddhist philosophy. Uh, but the sixth chapter, the one I'm going to focus on right now, is, has the same sort of message that we ought to um, extirpate anger. And if I have time, I'll say a little bit about um, uh, the Dalai Lama has actually written a nice book called Healing Anger. Uh, which is a double entendre, and maybe I'll get to that, um, on this specific um, uh, part of the text, the sixth book of uh, uh, Shantideva. I think, he bl I think it's one of his very, very favorite texts, but it's a, it's a big hit among uh, lots of um, Buddhists. It's a canonical text. So just background. Some of you may know a fair amount about Buddhism, but this goes back to the truth point. So uh, Buddhists think that there are three poisons in our souls. I have them on uh, the list here. So Buddhist psychology... Um, posits three poisons in human nature, which create disease, make you feel uncomfortable uh, 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 internally. And these are uh, the three are greed, thirst, and avarice for all the things I want. Like I want a lot of stuff. I pass it, you know, I have a nice car. 
I pass another car on the highway and I, I want that car. I have car lust, I have car avarice. Um, I'm always looking for my own competitive or comparative advantage. It comes to me quite easily. Um, I think that things are fine, but they're not. And notice the second one of a poison in human nature in the Buddhist view, it's a poison, is anger and resentment. Now, there are complicated translation issues here, but I'm not going to get into that because we're not a, uh, uh, that kind of uh, talk today. Um, but I get angry and resentful. And why do I get angry and resentful? Because I don't get what I want. Okay? So there's ego at play right here from the get-go. In fact, the only reason to get angry or resentful is because you don't get what you want. The third, these are all in a family of, um, uh, of attitudes that have to do, and the third one is illusion. So this is related to the truth itself. I believe such things as that I deserve to get what I want. I believe I should be at the front of the line or that my car should be further uh, to its destination than it is because of the traffic, okay? And uh, that's an illusion. Why should I, why do I deserve to be any further in the traffic than I am because I left when I did and that's what the traffic is. Um, so these things, of course, are part of the Buddhist path in Shantideva and elsewhere um, is to somehow overcome the sort of dominance of ego which is at the root of um, uh, at least uh, some of our anger practices. Now, the core illusion, as I say here, that runs through and sustains the poisons, a kind of Buddhist original sin, is that I am an ego and that, uh, that I am the self, or there is a self in me, that what I get, gain, and acquire or own accretes to me, solidifies me, and makes me resilient, permanent. Uh, and uh, the idea is that this is an illusion that needs to be crushed. It's actually a metaphysical mistake. So from the Buddhist point of view, this is like, these are not just like questions about local practices, like when it, we could get along so much better if we didn't get so angry with each other. It, that's true too, right? But it's much bigger than that. It's about the right perspective on things in general. And this is where the earlier chapters of Shantideva come in about how to overcome uh, the um, illusion of uh, ego, uh, the poisons that accrue to your ego, and uh, uh, what the practices in the, uh, in the Bodhisattva's way of life involve is awakening this feeling which allegedly we all, all humans have innately, which is called bodhicitta, which is um, something like the desire, very incipient, not fully blossomed, to want to alleviate suffering whenever and wherever you come upon it. It could even be at first that you want to alleviate the suffering because it's making you uncomfortable. But that's okay. You've got that. Okay, this is a, this is a claim. I claim in my uh, other parts of my work that every single culture that I've ever looked at has a view of what human nature is like deep down inside beneath the clothes of culture. Every view, every culture has one of those. It's very, very hard to figure out how you do controlled experiments to know that this was true. But, but this reminds me, for example, of uh, Mencius, in, um, uh, the great Chinese philosopher in uh, 2A6, says this, anyone, anyone, even Hitler, were he see, to see a child falling into a well, would immediately feel alarm and compassion. Not because he wanted to get in good with the child's parents, not because he wanted to get famous, not because of this or that, no instrumental reasons. It just would come naturally to it. Now, you might be able to override it, like Hitler might be able to override that if it's a child of a certain sort. But the point is, the impulse is there. The impulse to care, somehow or other, is there. So the Buddhist project, then, is, uh, is to awaken that positive impulse, the impulse towards what Seneca would say, virtue, which just cares about helping, good things, not about repaying. So Bodhicitta, this is in uh, the third book of uh, Shantideva, he says, uh, what I say to myself is, and this is how a bodhisattva works, a, a Buddhist saint who wants to relieve suffering. He says, I am medicine for the sick. May I be both doctor and the nurse until sickness does not recur. May I be an inexhaustible treasure for impoverished beings. May I wait upon them with various forms of offering." Eventually, by awakening this feeling, I take vows. 
all those who suffer in the world do so because of their desire for their own happiness. All those in the world are so because of the desire for the ha all those happy in the world are so because of their desire for the happiness of others. That's in the eighth chapter. So the idea here is that this is a claim about psychology. Okay, claim is that it, the more egoistic you are, this could be considered like an instrumental reason for you not to be so selfish. Um, You'll notice, if you look around, that the people who are most miserable, possibly the really irascible types, there are other negative emotions possibly in the vicinity too, are so because they're so self-focused. They want what they want, not, they keep not getting it, the whole world is against them, and they're constantly feeling angry and acting out their anger. But those who are happy in the world, look around, find some, are so because of their desire for the happiness of others. It's a paradoxical idea, right? That um, uh, egoism makes um, uh, people unhappy, and uh, altruism makes everyone happy, including the altruist. It's puzzling. Shanti Deva then in chapter six says this: anger is worse than all the other. Yes, do you want to? Is it egocentric to help other people in order to make it better for yourself? That's the sixty-four thousand dollar question, right? <laughs> And it, it, Buddhists might say it doesn't matter because that would be what they sometimes call skillful means. If I have to motivate you a little bit by a carrot, that's okay. If, to get, if I can start to get you to realize that by being caring for other people, you'll yourself be happier, you'll be more outside yourself, and so your reason initially is egotistical, then you might learn that it's its own reward. And we don't have to worry about that later on, but that's an excellent question, thank you. So first we're told that, and this is now chapter six, anger is worse than all the other vices. It alone can undermine thousands of eons worth of merit. Now you might not be being more secular type of people, might not be worried about eons of merit and karmic rewards and you know, how many uh, about your future lives. But, but the overall, but it, it's an interesting sort of psychological view here because Shantideva in these sections actually discusses other somewhat negative emotions. Here they are. Greed, hubris, lust, jealousy, closed-mindedness. Many other states of mind are both afflictive and destructive. They're personally afflictive and they're destructive of relationships. Okay, if I'm greedy, I want more from the company, I pay you less, and so on and so forth. So that's not good. Uh, it harms me and it harms you. But bad as these other vices are, they're compatible with experience in sustaining um, compassion. The overall commitment to seek enlightenment in order to benefit all human beings. Now why is that exactly? Well, I mean, it's complicated, but the picture is something like this. Um, uh, as we sometimes say, you know, at, at Christmas, imagine the boss who, like at Christmas holidays, you know, gives you a uh, rum cake and gives you a little bonus. So you go home to the family and you give the family the rum cake and you tell them about the little bonus and uh, you say, of course, he's still an asshole, <laughs> right? But so he's greedy and he's an asshole, but he sort of did what he did there was at least nice, okay? Um, uh, uh, Shanti Davis seems to think that anger just completely cancels out any other virtue. And why is that? Maybe related to the Buddhist view that you're seeking to harm the other, I'm sorry, to the uh, Stoic view that you're seeking to harm another person. Now, Buddhist metaphysics um, is required here, and I'm not gonna have time to talk about this. Uh, let me see how I'm doing on time. Yeah, I'm gonna end in uh, nine or 10 minutes. Um, uh, so the, for the Buddhist argument against anger to work properly, you really do need to bring in the sort of whole metaphysical view and I don't have time to talk about that, but roughly the idea is simply that um, when I see another person who's harmed me, I am to remember, I think there's a passage on here. Um, uh, yeah, this is uh, related to what's called dependent origination and uh, impermanence. So first of all, what's going on now will pass. This is a doctrine of impermanence, okay? What's going on now and seems so unbelievably, fantastically important to my wheel and woe and you are making me miserable as a human being, will pass. And we know how time uh, does that. Uh, the other thing is, uh, there's a certain attitude we could have towards the person who is harming us, and this is on page four. Um, so this, these are all passages from chapter six. Maybe I'll just read these, let you ponder, and we'll talk about them in discussion. Whatever transgressions and evil deeds of various kinds there are, all arise through the power of conditioning factors. Well, there is nothing that arises independently. 
I mean, Hitler arose because of conditioning factors. 6.31. Hence, everything is governed, governed by other factors, which in turn are governed by others. And in this way, nothing governs itself. Having understood this, that's my timer, sorry. Having understood this, I should not become angry with phenomenon that are like apparitions. They don't matter that much. In the, from the perspective of eternity, they don't matter that much. Next passage. Therefore, even if one sees a friend or an enemy behaving badly, friend or enemy behaving badly, one can reflect that there are specific conditioning factors that determine this and thereby remain happy. It's an, you're being asked to adopt a certain attitude, do a little cognitive behavioral therapy on yourself. Next passage, 6.64. And my hatred towards those who damage sacred, this is a fascinating one, because you remember what the Taliban did and maybe now what ISIS is, some people. This is a good one. And my hatred towards those who damage sacred images and stupas or who abuse the true teaching is not appropriate, since the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are not distressed. Last time I was here at Stanford, I think it was during the Dalai Lama's last visit about four or five years ago, and there was, as often happens, Tibetan monks making a sand, what do you call that, a sand mandala? mandala? mandala. Yeah, and you make that, it takes like the better part of a week, and then it yields to its, back to impermanence. Okay, that's a different attitude, admittedly, it's a very different attitude. And my hatred, okay, uh, when people harm one's teachers, relatives, and others dear to us, one should, as above, regard it as arising on the basis of conditioning factors and refrain from anger towards them. Now this is, again, more in the sense of truisms. It has a lot to do with the background metaphysics about which, in the question period, I can answer. Let me just now give, um, in closing, my, uh, four responses that I hear all the time and that I've written a whole chapter exploring. Um, they kind of, they make me nervous. Um, that is, they're, uh, they ha all have their plausibility and the four arguments are on your handout, um, impossible. So one, the, the, impo the, the argument about impossible just says this, look at anger is a natural attitude. We evolved with anger and we're gonna get angry and end of discussion. It's impossible to extirpate it. Um, uh, that's, uh, uh, I won't talk about that. I'll just tell you that that's out there. Second one is attachment. It claims, and this is a common argument that's given against people like Taoists, Buddhists, and Stoics. It says, in order to really have a great life, you need to be attached to certain things. You need to be able to experience like real commitment and love. And as soon as you commit, feel real commitment and love, then if you harm the person I love, I want to kill you. It's as simple as that. Or if I lose my beloved daughter, okay, it's just tragic. To, to ask for a detachment is to ask for a person who's like not normal human, okay, something like that, and that that's not a good thing, uh, that we can't live. We, don't, we just don't want to choose that form of life. In, then there's injustice, which I'll focus on in, for two minutes, and then catharsis. Okay, so injustice says um, that there are some kinds of anger, and this would be in the vicinity of five and six and seven, which just are really important. In fact, they're necessary because we couldn't respond to the world the way it really is and will be without um, certain kinds of righteous anger. Catharsis, there's psychologists in the room, is a familiar argument which just says something like this. Um, uh, sometimes bad things happen to you. There's a wonderful book by a philosopher named Susan Bryson um, called Aftermath. It's about uh, her story of recovering from attempted murder and a rape um, in 1991 in France and coming to deal with um, her own um, uh, anger, fear, terror, and overcoming. And, and the idea was that the catharsis was important. Okay, what about injustice? So here's an example um, uh, that uh, Martha Nussbaum gives in a book called Therapy of Desire. Nussbaum's a good philosopher at Chicago. She tells this story about Elie Wiesel, and this is uh, on page five on the bottom. Wiesel was a child in one of the Nazi death camps. On the day the Allied forces arrived, the first member of the liberating army he saw was a very large black officer. Walking into the camp and seeing what there was to be seen, this man began to curse, shouting at the top of his voice. As Wiesel watched, he went on shouting and cursing for a very long time. And the child Wiesel thought, watching him, now humanity has come back. 
Now with that anger, humanity has come back. Now, that's a very touching story, but I'm not quite sure that Nussbaum says in the passages, and she's actually changed her mind recently. She's now come to my side that anger is always bad, but that's a different. <laughs> I mean, not that I really believe it. or I don't know. I'm very confused. <laughs> um, but here she says, and th there's many people who say this, that at least for very certain terrible types of injustice, anger is uh, required. It's necessary. But I think if you think about this case, at least I invite you to think about this and then I'll stop, is simply this. Imagine, uh, uh, first of all, Wiesel was the kind of kid who somehow or other, given how much his life had been traumatized up until then, was not traumatized by the sight of a large man officer shouting at the top of his lungs. You could easily imagine that it would have freaked him out or made him even worse, made his situ situation even worse. I mean, he did respond by saying, humanity has returned. But I'm not sure that every child his same age in a death camp would respond to a shouting, um, angry officer that humanity has returned. One could imagine something different. Imagine this kind of situation. Imagine that the officer, instead of starting to shout and scream in fury, had started to weep. And imagine that his weeping became contagious among the soldiers. Could that have had the same effect of feeling that humanity had returned? I don't personally see why not. I'm not recommending that would have been better. It's a different world that I'm imagining. But, but I don't quite see why anger was necessary there. And that, of course, is uh, a huge question um, about what's necessary, what's normal. And that leaves us back at uh, square one. I tried to give you a little bit of an insight into sort of two traditions which we intersect with. One is part of our own lineage in the West, the Stoic, and another one that we live in cosmopolitan worlds. This view is out there and it calls upon us at least to think carefully about our anger norms and anger practices. So thank you very much. And What are the practices that would lead to uh, being less angry? So um, they both have toolboxes. Um, so one set of practices um, that Seneca thinks you need to do is you need to live among people who will teach the children that getting angry is always bad. That, it, it's a very different. But the idea is you have to start out. I'm just reporting. I'm not defending at this point, right? I'm just reporting. So both of these uh, traditions are quite aware of the fact that moral development takes place in ecologies of permissions and norms and parents who have different attitudes. Like so, you know, uh, um, um, I was brought up in a family that my father's ma favorite moral um, instruction was straighten out and fly right. Now that was supposed to contain an awful lot of information, <laughs> but it, I knew what it meant. It meant certain things like you don't do this, that, and the other thing. I mean, certain families have attitudes that move into the idea that you should vent a lot. Okay, uh, Stoics, for example, would think you shouldn't let the kids vent too much. Now, these are interesting psychological questions. Again, we have psychologists in the room. As for adults, the view would be things like. You should, whenever you're standing in the line at Starbucks and you start to get pissy and frustrated, say to yourself, be indifferent to indifferent things. Buddhist practices include all the familiar mindfulness practices of trying to um, let go of those three poisons. Now then, in addition to letting go of the three poisons, you want to work on, I call these views, there, most views of human nature involve seeds and weeds. Like there are, like Mencius famously, if you know anything about Chinese philosophy, he thought there were four positive sprouts in human nature. We're just like wonderful little darlings. You put us out in the sun and then we grow into virtuous people. You respect your elders, you're compassionate and loving, you're respectful of hierarchy, and you're just. Well, we know that's not quite right, you know? So a Buddhist view would be, watch out for these poisons. You need to um, cultivate the good seeds, compassion, bodhicitta, 
And, but it, it's a very developmental, I think, educationally rich view. In uh, uh, the Buddhists, but not the Stoics, had children's books. The Buddhists have lots of children's books, Jakarta stories, which are about Buddha's previous lives. Now, Buddha does get angry in some of them. But the kids read these stories, and they learn that Buddhas and bodhisattvas don't get angry. Do they get even? Sometimes. <laughs> See, it's, but those would be, so there's a whole list. The Buddhists in general do something like this. You'll be familiar with this. So, and, and there's prescriptions. What you try to do, so here's, a, here's disturbing passages in Shantideva that I didn't tell you about. These don't have to do with, but it's an answer to your question. Suppose you find yourself feeling inappropriate lust towards someone who you shouldn't feel inappropriate lust for. Shantideva says, imagine them um, covered in excrement. There's a lot of trying to imagine states of mind which are incompatible with what you're experiencing. Another passage, I forget what book that's in, if the excrement thing doesn't work, imagine him or her as a rotting corpse with skeletal tissue and the whole thing. So these are supposed to be antidotes. Now here, that, this is how it works in terms of anger. I need to try, if, I, if I'm furious at you, I need to somehow find a um, set of moral emotions or moral attitudes which are incompatible with that. And, and they involve things like gratitude. So gratitude practices would be common things. You know, right now, um, you know, I, I mean, it, you know, it, right now, you get angry at a person and you think suddenly, because anger always overreaches, ugh, I can't stand you. And then I switch, I try to engage in the practice of thinking, how wonderful you've made contributions to my life. Now that kind of practice, so there's a lot of what we would now call cognitive behavioral therapy, using antidotes that are incompatible with the other emotion. And like I said, studying astronomy, from a Buddhist point of view, there's a lot of things that are like studying astronomy. You're supposed to think, you're supposed to think about how insignificant you are in the greater scheme of things. Yeah. Uh, first gentleman here, yep, and then I got one, two, three, yeah. Regarding the first claim about impossible, yeah. uh, is it possible to answer the question of whether it is possible to eliminate anger, and what kind of evidence would, would uh, serve to, to, <coughs> to, to, uh, to give us an answer to that? All right. So, good. So remember, one objection is, well, stop talking about this because it's impossible, right? And in philosophy, we say ought implies can. If you say you ought to do such and so, you better be able to do such and so. So um, a really short answer is this. Um, you could look at not just what, say, Buddhists and Stoics say, but see if you could ever find cultures in which the anger norms and practices are radically different from ours. Because that would be a way of sort of saying, well, what's actual is possible, and there are at least people who, who mix it up a lot. So the sources that I found there are, there are, um, in the anthropological record, there's a, a woman named Jean Briggs who works on Eskimos, and I, she has a book called Never in Anger. I read that hopefully. What is clear among these Eskimo groups is they're never allowed to express anger. So that's the angry behavior part. Do they feel anger? Yeah, it looks like they do. Another good source I found in the anthropological literature is a book by Catherine Lutz, L-U-T-Z, called Unnatural Emotions. And she does think that uh, people in the Caroline Islands in the South Pacific have very different ways of doing anger. Now, I yet haven't told you yet about, right. So, what's, so that would be two places to go, to like just look around anthropologically to see how people do it differently. Another way to do it would be to sort of think developmentally and look at children. Now, pretty clearly, children experience frustration, annoyance, and things like that. It doesn't, it's not clear, I've asked around. Uh, uh, do they experience anger? It depends. It depends on whether frustration, having a dirty diaper, or not having mommy's uh, breast is 
the, the fuel for anger or it's the beginnings of anger that, that gets canalized. Um, and, um, I don't think anyone thinks, but this is true for a lot of like, the Ekman faces, you know those seven faces or six or seven faces. I don't think people think that kids make angry faces at the get-go, but they make some things in the vicinity. So you might say it's going to be hard, but maybe not impossible. It's a, but you're, you, it'd be very tricky. How to, you'd have to look closely. A lot of things that people say are innate, like take disgust. There's a lot of research in moral psychology lately on disgust. And people say, well, everybody in every culture feels disgust. So it's not surprising that some cultures people talk about disgust for communists or disgust for homosexuals. Well, it is surprising that they talk about disgust for communists or disgust for homosexuals because if there is any kind of beginning natural disgust, it has to do with things like excrement, vomit, basic bodily fluids that are really dangerous. That would be the sort of evolutionary place you look. Now, first of all, notice that people who care for the elderly, nurses, Mother Teresa, they overcame even that kind of disgust response. And it's pretty clear that the robust kind of moralistic, moralistic disgust responses are culturally shaped. So that gives me kind of hope there, too. Even if there is something like dispositions towards anger, culture can do a lot to construct the possibility space. But please. I wonder if the issue is not so much that anger is good or that they're righteous or what have you, as it is the relationship we have with our anger. Okay. So to the extent you know it, to the extent that you've experienced it, to the extent to which you comprehend your anger, um, I would assume that that relationship really alters the whole thing about anger. Uh, and you're a psychotherapist, so I take what you say seriously. So you think that, no, seriously, I mean, so if you know, as it were, certain things about your anger, where it's coming from, why you're having it, of course, why you're having it might, might explain your, I take it that there'd be some people, patients or clients of yours, who would know a lot about the ca causes or sources of their anger. Suppose they say something like, I was abused as a child, sexually abused, physically abused as a child. That's why I get so angry. Now, you, you'd... Well, that's not what I mean by, by knowing. So tell me more, yeah. What I, know, what I mean by knowing is you have an intimate connection to it in a sense of which you comprehend it, you grasp it. And that would be... It's not a matter of using it as an excuse. Right. Um, but I guess the, still the question would be whether or not like, I guess what, I think I just will accept what you said because you're the expert here. I guess what I'm trying to get at here is even that kind of set of practices and like understanding our own feeling states might still come, in fact, I, I would argue would inevitably come inside a culture which gives certain permissions and has certain norms for what's appropriate or inappropriate. And what I'm trying to get at here today is are there norms, psychological, sociological, ecological, broadly construed, that are plausible that should lead us to want to engage in practices to really work to tune down our anger so we get to the point that we are the kind of persons who are, it's dim. We kind of remember what it was like or when we watch movies, we see it. And not just think of it as for sages and bodhisattvas and saints, but something highly valuable to aspire to. And that would be a different kind of. Thank you. Please. I know you're in. Yes. Just in the last paragraph on your Yeah. The distinction that's drawn between hatred and anger. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but maybe could be something that could be Okay, good. 
So um, I don't, yeah, you, you just, so I didn't say this, but it's the last paragraph on the page. So the Dalai Lama, actually, in his, um, uh, his nice reading of um, Shanti Davis, chapter six, called Healing Anger, he does make this move that Nussbaum makes. You see, a lot of people, this is a very, let me say again what I sort of said at the beginning, because you, you're just helping me. So what I, when I think about this topic, in fact, I think about this when I think about varieties of what I call moral possibility in general. Once we suggest tampering with how we do a certain sort of emotion or set of emotions, we know all the responses that we give internal to our weird form of life. That is, we know exactly what to say. We say, and I give them here, we say, it's impossible. The biologists have shown it's impossible. They say, OK, let's wait a second and think about what we know about the plasticity. You see, this is a big topic in general. Like, you know, <laughs> how plastic is our nature? How adjustable is our nature? Just because we are all angry all the time <laughs> doesn't mean that all people in all cultures. I mean, here's a very important fact. Modern humans are 250,000 years old. It's only for 12,000 years that we lived in communities above 130 people. In fact, probably that's the Dunbar number, uh, Robin Dunbar, the anthropologist, who says pretty sure he's willing to die in the last ditch, that we weren't bigger than that. We usually were more like small band hunter-gatherers, 30 people, 40 people, okay? So negotiating sort of interpersonal relations where everybody knew everybody else's reputation, everybody knew what everybody else is doing, and there were hierarchies, may have been that there were worlds in which we didn't have to depend that much on anger, okay, for management. Now, the larger worlds get, the more there's uh, class, you know, um, um, uh, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, uh, class would just be one example. But large sizes, it may be that we're called upon to energize emotional economies that actually weren't very natural back in the day. Now, if that's so, um, you could still make this distinction that Nussbaum makes, and in fact a lot of people uh, make this, that the Dalai Lama also makes between anger and hatred. Hatred is really bad because you really do want the other to suffer, but then there's anger for just causes, to end racism, to end sexism, and so on and so forth. Um, I think, I find that plausible. I partly think I find it plausible because that's what people like I say. <laughs> and um, uh, Every uh, Tibetan uh, Buddhist scholar that I've asked about this distinction is Shanti Deva says the Dalai Lama is completely making it up. <laughs> that there's no distinction there between hatred and anger in Shanti Deva. He thinks all the whole, all those emotions go. Okay, this is interesting. Like Mark and I were talking about this at lunchtime. I mean, some some parts of this require a weird metaphysics, and I'll just state it. But this is the hatred anger distinction. You might say this, look it, I am sick and tired of, um, say, racial oppression. And we say we have to fight to end racial oppression. I'm angry and indignant and furious at the oppressors, and we're going to take it to the streets. Okay, so that's be two things. You have justified anger, and you have a certain method of getting your way. The, here's where... It's a weird response. It seems to us a weird response to say, that's very egotistical of you to think that like, the world's supposed to cooperate with you and your people now. Like, wait it out. Anger doesn't do any good for people. See, there's, this is a Buddhist view. Mark and I were talking about this. It's a very common Buddhist view to say, look at, well, I think that the world's supposed to, just like you think that Starbucks is supposed to have shorter lines because you're now there. You think that there's supposed to be an end to gender and racial oppression now because you're here. Chill. <laughs> I'm just saying. I don't think that's not to me a plausible response, but that's the view. See, that's the view. You have to remember that the, the, the same tradition that Shanti Dave is from, if you ask a, uh, in fact, I have, in, in Shanti Dave's lineage, you say something like, I'm curious, how many like, lives do an average, like a normal guy like me, supposing I was Buddhist, going to have before I reach final nirvana? And the a common answer is this. 
Imagine that there's a mountain range 84,000 times larger than the Himalayas. And imagine each day is a lifetime, a normal human lifetime. And imagine like each day you walk up to that mountain range and you touch it with a piece of cloth. And imagine how long it will take for that entire mountain range to erode by you touching it. <laughs> That's how long it will take you to get to final nirvana. Chill. <laughs> it requires an entirely different, I mean, I really get it. I mean, so, yeah. My, I was also looking at that last paragraph. So, in terms of Martin Luther King, who wasn't, didn't come across as angry, but wanted change and did sit-ins and, yeah. you know, what do you think, I mean, is that something? Yeah. So there are plenty of people inside our cultural heritage, uh, uh, you might say, you could map people like um, Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. Uh, into this. You could map, um, the other story I almost told you is when I've been to South Africa, which is three times, I want to kill all the white people there, including myself, I guess. You know, that's sort of my reaction whenever I go to South Africa still. And, um, uh, and so I'm amazed by a set of practices there that led to truth and reconciliation. They don't deny completely that they're angry, they who I mean, you know, everybody really. It was a perfect storm because you had, you know, the society was about to break out into complete and utter self-destruction. There was terrible black-on-black -black violence. You had Mandela who had read Gandhi, who of course believed in apartheid to a point, unlike Amdekar. Uh, he had read some Jain sources, was aware of the uh, uh, Indic virtues of Ahisma. Uh, nonviolence. You had even Afrikaners who said there are resources in the Dutch Reformed Church to forgive. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, Sermon on the Mount. You had Nelson Mandela, I mean um, uh, Desmond Tutu finding resources in the Anglican Church. But all these resources that led to truth and reconciliation, like King and uh, people here, um, it, it allowed you to acknowledge anger um, but to do something unusual with it. So that's what you just said is a helpful, there are other ways to do this than the extirpation idea. The idea is that you face up to me, you acknowledge what you did to me and my people, and we go on. Truth and reconciliation. Am I not angry? It's an interesting question. It does something pretty wonderful and magical to um, anger. Truth and reconciliation seems to. Right. I wonder if the Buddhists might be valuing anger more than you're letting on, because uh, in certain traditions, there's Mahakala, there's Manjushri with the Sword of Wisdom. There are wrathful deities. This isn't mostly in Tibetan Buddhism, but there are these manifestations of anger. But it's it's never destructive anger, or it's a, it's destructive towards the right uh, impediments, I guess. And I, I'm not a scholar on this, as you know, <laughs> but, I, but I'm just the things that I've seen. It make me think that. Uh, even in His Holiness's own tradition, there is a, an acknowledgement of the utility of some kinds of anger. There's a big internal to Buddhism question about wrathful gods, and aren't they just the sublimations of... So there, there, anybody who likes that response that I made about catharsis, saying, look it, catharsis is the objection that goes like this. There's hell to pay if you totally if you make believe you're not angry, that you're going to be, actually, if you don't get angry, you're just making believe. <laughs> and you're doing something like stuffing it. And if you stuff it, you're going to develop terrible neuroses and things like that. And so catharsis says you've got to do, get it out somewhere. So one idea internal to some of the Buddhisms is that wrathful gods are playing this role of helping, as one scholar says, to metabolize or sublimate my anger by... God's fighting it out. You could say it's sort of akin to Satan and God fighting it out. But you say, they do it. It's like, um, what do they call that, uh, all these wars that are going on now, proxy wars? Here, though, you have gods fight the proxy wars, and then you're somehow released. 
I haven't a clue, but I think that's a valuable point. Yeah. Mark, you had a point on that? I wanted to go back to the South African example. Yeah. An awful lot of people killed each other yeah. to get to that point. Right. So it, it was, they weren't managing their anger. What? Well, after the fact that they... Yeah. There were, I think, 50,000 people, as many that were killed in Vietnam were killed in uh, KZ, uh, in, uh, yeah, black on black violence, uh, which that was okay with still the, going on, still going on, yeah. I wasn't certainly, certainly saying, it was just using the Martin Luther King Jr. question to sort of say, this isn't like a completely unfamiliar problem to us, right? Because we do have people who have talked about how to get to just resolutions of long historical problems without there being complete bloodbaths. The, the people like Seneca, there's another example. S Seneca might have said, oh, it's fine to have a bloodbath if you need to. Once in a while, you'll need a bloodbath. Just don't be angry. Don't get all bent out of shape. You have to understand, that there's, there's some wonderful literature on still, uh, on stoic warriors that the you know, West Point and Annapolis, they read all the time, because a good soldier doesn't get emotional. Um, there's a lot of hands up. One there in the back. <clears throat> Could you please talk about the response number two on attachment? Um, just uh, that, that's the objection to which I feel most personally uh, involved right now. And oh, yeah. <laughs> wondering if you think that attachment is A, necessary for like a really good life, and B, does it inherently come with anger? Can they be like... OK, good. So, um, so here is, here's one problem with the Stoic view in general in response to you. So Stoics seem to think in general you should get rid of all the emotions. Now that, that's an extreme uh, view. Like they think you should not get sad or angry. See, sad seems more wholesome to me. And I, I started this out by mentioning that the, the meeting that I went to that I met Brian at uh, years ago, um, in uh, India was about destructive emotions and how to overcome them. Now, which emotions are destructive? In some traditions, people think love is <laughs> destructive. What's love? You know, in the olden days, we looked into each other's eyes and said, darling, I can't believe our good fortune. I love you more than anything. And now we say, I look in your eyes and we have oxytocin poisoning together or something. <laughs> you know. We're, we, we, our pheromones sort of detect each other and then we're off to the poisoning. You know, and it's all like... <laughs> so these things are puzzling, you know, because we do know that love can get you bent out of shape. And so, so uh, the best way I know how to answer your question is something like this. Um, it goes to another tradition. So Zhuangzi, the famous passage in uh, the Taoist, great Taoist philosopher Zhuangzi, who's like fourth of his century, um, uh, uh, in, in Chinese philosophy, everybody's on about how you behave at funerals. This is in relation to sorrow, right? So you arrive at a funeral, and uh, so someone goes, and Zhuangzi, who was known to have a wife who he adored, and she adored him, his friends show up. They're probably Confucians. And they show up, and Zhuangzi, I think, is playing a drum. And his friends start gossiping to each other. They say, can you believe it? He's not weeping and wailing. And Zhuangzi says, when she died, I wept. And, but I thought in preparing for her death about how nature works and the beauty that she was once lifeless and then became alive. And we shared this beautiful relationship and now she's gone. And I now play the drums too. Okay, now, so the example, the reason I use that example is not on the anger side, it's just on the, the sadness side. It would be, I think we would say that a person is not the kind of creature we want to be around if they can't feel loss. But how exactly you feel loss or express your loss seems to be culturally sort of optional. You know, I mean, it would just vary from culture to culture, funereal practices. You just think about if you go to funerals or wakes and different traditions, how much drinking goes on, Irish, lots. <laughs> um, how deep you bury people, there's a lot of arguments about that in different cultures, and that, it, but, what, how much respect you're showing. So I think clearly human relations are really important, and it would be weird not to feel sorrow. Now you can see the response being, well, if you're feeling sorrow, you're an egoist. It's one of the poisons, right? 
but so that seems to me to be a limit at which I want to stop and get off the Buddhist you know, uh, extirpation of egoism. Because I think certain relations we just think are great and excellent. Now, there, though, it seems that by parody we'd want to say something like, if you harm my daughter, then there's hell to pay. And I don't care if you're conditioned to harm my daughter. <laughs> there's still hell to pay. Now that seems, so my view would be, but I've been brought up in this tradition, I'm angry, I'm more than angry okay, at you, and I will get revenge. The Stoic view seems to be get revenge, but don't get angry. <laughs> and the Buddhist view seems to go in that direction as well. So the, I think we, we clearly need attachments, we want to say, for meaningful human lives. Many people justifiably say that most of the Buddhisms developed for men who had left their families and were living alone and were not going to be in attached familial relations anymore. There's certainly that in the tradition, certainly that. So you might just say, well, these are people who opted into a, in fact, my son, I say this in my, um, uh, Matthew Ricard, has he been here to speak? Right, week. So you could tell Matthew, he knows this. So Matthew Ricard, who some people studied and said is the happiest person in the world, my son, who was 17 during this time, I was in India, and Matu was walking down the street, and we said hi to him, and I said, he's so happy. And Ben said, he said, he's not married and he doesn't have teenage children. <laughs> so you, deta you detach from life, and you can sort of, your emotions don't have to get the best of you, maybe, but... I, I'm sympathetic with what you're saying about like attachments seem to engender these attached emotions is your point, right? And I agree. I think so. That's kind of what I was asking. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. Thank you. Uh, anger is a response to moral injury. What about anger is a response? I'm, just, I'm, I'm struggling to identify uh, out of these options on the board which I most, might most closely align with. Those would be five, six, and seven possibly the way we use language, I think. So anger as a response to moral injury, a violation of a, a legitimate moral expectation. As in the case of maybe uh, in war when people are forced into situations or the police officer that has to respond to a circumstance uh, where that might play in. So. Well, uh, okay, I think, I think what I would say is something like this, and this is helpful to maybe sort of come to the end. Um, so I think the culture that I'm familiar with now, namely the US, that I spend a lot of time in, in various ways, is uh, for a host of reasons, very complicated ones, I think quite um, has a low bar on the permissions for feeling anger and permissions for acting angrily. I'll just say that. Now, if you start to make the bar go up, I think you get into a view which is more like Aristotle's original view. It's, permissi it's not permissible to get angry about being inconvenienced by the movement of other people. And you really should work on yourself not to do that, okay, by saying be indifferent to indifferent things, like when you're stuck in traffic or in lines. At now, you raise the question, though, what about when you get into this vicinity, where there are legitimate expectations about fair or just treatment of me, okay, by you? Okay, then isn't that fair? And that's where the distinction between hatred and anger is coming in. Okay, I, um, uh, I, I should hold you accountable. And with that comes a certain kind of feeling state. Now again, the Stoics and the Buddhists are going to say, it's perfectly okay to require me to be accountable. It's perfectly okay to demand complete justice from everybody else. Just don't it's not good for you. It'll poison your soul if you feel angry about it. It'll poison your relations, and it'll get messy all over the place. So there's instrumental reasons why they think it's a problem, even in those cases, and some intrinsic reasons, again, having to do with virtue only tries to improve or end suffering, something like that. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you for a great talk. Thank you. Thank you.